Biodiversity Conservation Foundation is an organization working towards conservation based on holistic approaches. It has started its contributions to nature conservation more than two decades by integrating indigenous knowledge with our own lifestyle. For instance, throwing grains in our backyard helps birds like house sparrow and other birds. But this simple action not only drives the birds, but also the ants, the best known ecosystem engineers of nature. So through this way, we headed towards providing all recipes for few of our neighborhood species, which later blossomed as reaching diversified species and conserving them. So as a fact, we are in the road of conservation with a holistic approach to it. And today, I am glad that we are blessed to work with you in this virtual platform to enable conservation even in this scenario. So a very good evening to everybody, whosoever is listening to us virtually. Although it is not a happy occasion for most of the people in our country, but somehow we can have these virtual gatherings and probably listen to each other, our experiences, our curiosities, and maybe take a resolve in the direction of not probably repeating some similar COVID-19 lockdown in the future. I guess we all are listening to many updates from national and international systems, firms, research units, universities, and governments that this is not the only possibility wherein we will be facing lockdowns, but humanity needs to prepare itself for similar incidences of diseases which can come out from animals which live near us. And in context of our increase from the numbers of about 10,000 human beings, which the lives which took shape in the cardinal of Africa or the cardinal of humanity, which is the southern part of Africa, currently we are placed nearly at the number around 8 billion. So I guess except for the oceans and very pristine of the forests humans have reached animals in a variety of ways and somehow the first slide which you possibly can see on your screen depicts that perspective in one manner so humans today have a lot of time at their disposal but thousands of years ago what would have crossed the mind of an early man, which you can visualize in this diagrammatic representation? This image has been sourced from Pinterest.com. And we all have read various chapters of history where early men had to either kill or avoid being killed in order to survive. I guess the amount of time which we are spending indoors these days is quantitatively much times higher than our forefathers and ancestors. So how have humans utilized the extra time which we get to imagine to rather utilize about 1500 cc of brain which we have or cranial capacity which we have. So. Archaeological studies have identified sophistication, not only in tools, but also in art expressions. I guess few of us who are having general interests would know that better tools have supported not only the food requirements and settlement of human societies, but the whole expression of being homo sapiens, sapiens, or the modern man. So somewhere, I wish to propound the channelization of fear. So as I was trying to discuss the concept of killing animals to survive or in order to avoid being killed, somewhere about 10 to 15,000 years ago, human beings become 
became agriculturists from confrontational scavengers. So the next image depicts a famous cave painting and it has been sourced from artisera.com and it depicts the very familiar image of how cavemen must have depicted their hunting journeys. So human beings moved from this status to settled status once agriculture was discovered and people could invent tools to harness the power of management and growth in context of sustaining a, sust a, a certain number of human beings in their vicinity. Of course, that also propounded division of labor. On this screen, interestingly, we depict the artwork of Warli, Suara, Gond, and many tribes which reside in this part of the world, which is South Asia, which still has about 2,500 or more tribes. So these tribes have depicted these images, which you can see on the screen, look quite similar to what people, I don't know whether I should call them people, but as of course, our forefathers must have tried to do in their initial days. So shall we call them just primitive or shall we address them as primitive? Because a lot of these expressions were in the Wally tribe members were trying to depict Mother Nature or the Suara tribe members were trying to depict the tree of life or the Gond communities were trying to depict the idea of domestication of animals or interconnectivity of multiple life forms. So all these wordings do not sound unfamiliar to people who discuss the concept of conservation. Conservation is an ideology or a perspective in context of a potential loss of species and resources due to their unsustainable use by the current generation of human beings. So somewhere this ideology of what we might lose or the fear of this loss has propounded us to conserve things. So in some ways, we can connect the dots in context of what this forefather of us must be doing in multiple caves in which they occupied in different parts of the world. And of course, how many tribes still continue to resist the forces of modernity. And somehow it is very sad for the most parts of the world that there is a huge tussle in between in context of how we would expect these tribes to behave and sort of maintain their status quo. And there are various propounders or academicians who support this part of the theory as opposed to another set of people who feel that they are also part of the common lot of human beings and they should also be supported with the benefits of modernity. In this two pole of modern human beings, and the people who are expressing these kind of artwork into their day to day lives. On this slide, we have a quintessential depiction of what modern human beings have been doing in and around their systems. So in between these two poles of modern human beings and the tribes, we have a whole gradient of kind of people who are still moving or transiting from village systems towards the concepts of modernity or towards the benefits of modernity. So in that context, it is very useful. It is very useful for us to ponder upon the questions around the human animal relationships, because somewhere, according to Professor E.O. Wilson from Harvard University, human beings have an innate tendency to express their linkages with other animal forms. There are researchers from the Cornell University at the United States of America who have identified linkages in between species which are non-related. And, and they have somehow, in the recent paper, they have 
propounded the idea of why human beings have an innate tendency to extend care for the animal systems which are around and in that paper by the researchers from Cornell University they were propounding the DNA linkages or genetic linkages in between the two systems or the two taxon or the two groups of organisms so human beings and the animals about which we care we share a lot of genes for instance I don't know how many of us are aware but you share about 90% of your genes with the odd house mouse and you share about 98.6% of your genes with chimpanzees and we have a similar kind of listing for multiple different organisms with which we share this common home called Earth. So on this slide which depicts the Ghazipur landfill located which is located on the eastern border, border of Delhi you can visualize the scene of about 10,000 kites in this enormous flock. These flocks of black-eared kites is visible from December to February every year and I will talk about it towards the later part of this presentation. So humans have a very two very unique abilities. One of them is to identify discontinuities which is in context of specific differentiations. So at the stage of the caveman itself or even further, human beings could attribute specific status to organisms. And it is not something which came up with Carolus Linnaeus. So researchers or biologists in multiple parts of the world take a lot of pride in their ability to identify distinctions in between multiple species but I think we should be quite humble in context of multiple stories around the abilities of our ancestors to identify sorry to identify these discontinuities for thousands of years there's a beautiful story about it if I would if allowed I would like to express it in context of the doctoral dissertation of Ernst Meyer Ernst Meyer is also known as 21st centuries or Darwin of the 20th century sorry so we do not have Professor Ernst Meyer between us but he was a famous ornithologist and evolutionist from Harvard and he went on to do his doctoral dissertation in Papua New Guinea a place where we find birds of paradise these birds of paradise are very famous for the enormous tails they have. So these tails are something which have caught the attention of people for hundreds of years and Alfred Wallace was also one of the evolutionists who, has, who mentioned about these birds. The interesting thing about the doctoral dissertation of Ernst Meyer was specific identification of 127 species which means he gave them a biological name something similar to mango's name which is called mangifera indica or humans biological name which is homo sapiens sapiens he was quite baffled when he got to understand that the local tribes on those islands already had 126 unique names for those species so we can already visualize the kind of social and ecological relationships which must have existed and which are there and which would of course undergo enormous changes as we alter human dominated systems in very profound ways. If we talk of South Asian systems, socio-ecological relationships with common animals like cattle macaques, multiple birds and dogs, it is expressed into our religious patronage and at times ritual feeding of animals. So what do these activities capture in context of human animal interface or in context of what humans call as nature? So nature is a very laden terminology and it was somewhat propounded 
in certain classification or, or in certain degree by people who colonize multiple parts of the world and ideally they translated nature as something where probably human impacts have not yet been realized but we are all well aware that the ability to reach at a place where humans impacts have not well been realized is not a privilege for probably 95% of people on earth 5 to 10% of people on earth can actually have the privilege of saying that they have visited the nature and natural aspects in context of the 5% 5% protected areas which we have in our country i'm sure there are only few forests left which will be free of human impacts so as i was discussing about the development and biodiversity and considering that we are addressing each other or we are virtually being connected by biodiversity conservation foundation it is important to understand why so much of biodiversity exists and why so many different animals and so many different associations with animals still survive for thousands of millions of years somewhere our problems and our opportunities are captured in the genetic material so the invention of the ideology of genetics allowed us to understand that deoxyribonucleic acid or dna is the reason with which multiple macroscopic macroscopic animal species could hold themselves on earth before dna was the genetic material we had ribonucleic acid which is another form of sugar and i think we all study till our preliminary high school the distinctions in between dna and rna and currently the world is under lockdown because of the enormous ability in the rna to undergo change and because rna as genetic material undergoes so much of change it has allowed viruses to become super parasites viruses have crippled humanity and human systems multiple times and somehow two episodes can be related well of course they are placed 100 years apart 100 years ago we had spanish flu which was caused by a virus with which had dna as it sorry rna as its genetic material and currently we are under lockdown because of another rna virus it has a double stranded rna and that's why our colleagues are struggling to find a cure for it so contextualizing dna and rna is important in terms of how biodiversity is actually capable of conserving its own variety so if it was not for dna we would not have so many organisms sustained on this planet for millions of years so the concept of conservation also can be linked in an analogical framework with the genetic material which allows so much of diversity on earth to coexist i was trying to contextualize the component of why so much of biodiversity still lies with us in context of dna and i will put the perspective of dna and in context of its analogical utilization to understand the impacts of urbanization so on our screen you can see the distribution of black kites on the face of earth which is almost all of the old world the orange depicts the populations which come down in the months of september in the months of winter and the yellow depicts the species which migrate uh, yellow depicts the species which are resident breeders this is a diagrammatic representation of the pathway which these kite follow from central asian landscapes to indian subcontinent and they have been noted down till by soro so is it tough for us to imagine that these movements have happened on the face of this planet even before human beings could evolve 
human beings, Homo sapiens sapiens, the earliest signature of modern human has been recorded only till 350,000 years. And the earliest hominids are still less than 10 million years in terms of our age on Earth. But these kites from the genus Milvus are about 25 million years old. So in that context, we have visited this planet and we have altered the landscapes across the Himalayas in multiple ways. So that is why it is important for us to focus that when humanity is urbanizing rapidly, urbanization is a registered movement of people from their rural systems to urban systems. And this urbanization is associated with the infrastructure which is created alongside. So just in last several decades itself, the urbanization has changed the fate of how landscapes appear on the planet. And currently, humanity is about 50% urbanized. In India, that statistic is at 33%. And southern China, South Asia, Africa, and Latin America are going to contribute to 98% of, of urbanization, which is supposed to happen over the next 30 years. In next 30 years, we'll expand this urbanization level to roughly 70%. And when our city systems are already facing a lot of crunch, when we have issues of maintaining the integrity of our cities in context of how much of pressure it can create on the ecological systems, on our health systems, on the integrity of multiple human stakeholder groups into our city systems, I don't know what will happen when we urbanize ourselves further, which essentially would mean pushing a lot of people into the limited urban space. In context of a comparison in between India and China, because we would relate with how much we would like to compare these two countries because of the tension for altogether different regions. And India, for that sake, has only about 20 cities of that order, which would, which essentially absorb most of the urbanization or movement of people from villages to urban systems. China, as opposed to India, has about 475 similar cities. So in context of how we are going to pack about 400 million people into our cities over the next 30 years is a big question. Would we change the infrastructure of our cities? Would we change the infrastructure of our rural systems, which are not yet cities? And this would be the question for the future generations. And this question cannot be solved without having a connection with the generations who already have suffered at the, because of the costs of urbanization. We always interact with our elders in context of what we wish to preserve, what they suggest to preserve. And of course, there is a whole generational tussle of why we should, we, why should we be preserving? We do read about the government mechanisms to preserve archaeological remains. We discuss with our parents and, of course, seniors in the society to somehow conserve our rituals and cultural values. And of course, whenever this happens, there is always a section in the society and there is always a component in us, the younger generation, to question these notions of conservation and preservation. We will try to give few perspectives in context of the small research which we do in National Capital Region. This research happens at about 30 sampling units of one square kilometer. This research took shape in order to understand the ability of a very common urban city scavenger, which we call as black kite in common terms. In Hindi, it is called Cheel. And in multiple Indian languages, it has its own different names. 
Of course, many of the city dwellers would rather like to address it as eagle because eagles again have a different aura around themselves and people somehow wish to relate with that aura. So this research happens to understand how these birds are settling into a whole gradient of urbanization represented before bird. So I guess you would all appreciate the fact that human perspectives about what a city should be like or where exactly should one settle in a city would differ from how a bird would expect it to be. A clear signature of that perspective can come from the ideology that we see a lot of trees, we see a lot of kites, but we don't see all kites occupying, or sorry, we do not see all trees being occupied by kite nests. That means there is some degree of selection from the kites which happens and we study this perspective from our sampling design which tends to ob observe a lot of raptor nests. So climbing a raptor nest which is about 15 meters high is not easy. We have to check these nests every week and that is why the support which we receive from our team members is very essential. The sampling also happens by putting transmitters on the back of these birds and the first thing which we got to notice in context of how a bird would have responded to a city which changed enormously in the last 30 to 40 years was almost no change in the breeding density of black kites. So black kites were pretty much constant in context of the breeding densities which they had in 1970s, which was about 15 nests per square kilometer. So another notion which people have had about kites is that they are pure scavengers. But we did notice kites getting full bodied prey into their nest systems. And it dispelled the myth of them being obligate scavengers. Kites were also expected to nest everywhere in the city systems and we found out that they do not like human-made structures as opposed to the common expectation of a bird which is very opportunistic. And because of this, it was important for us to understand the first signature of Neolithic age. So Neolithic age onwards, archaeologists have started to register social places where people would put the trash. And this trash, of course, attracted a lot of opportunistic animals. Currently, in all of the cities in the world, and definitely in this part of South Asia, we have landfills. Landfills are the sites where about 500 trucks offload their garbage on a daily basis. And it gives rise to the enormous human-animal interface which is what we wish to study in context of how human areas, animal areas and waste areas are supposedly demarcated. Part of the text is not visible to most of the... Is the screen still visible? Yes, yeah, screen is visible. Like that. Okay, okay. Yep. So we need to discuss human animal perspectives on a variably developed pockets of the city. So I guess you can relate when we stand on top of the mound of this garbage hillock on the eastern border of Delhi, you can understand the different pockets of the city which are variably developed. So this is part of Ghaziabad, which is associated with Delhi. This is the eastern border of Delhi with high rise buildings. And when we have so many stakeholders within human systems, and when we have enormous waste areas associated with middle class or informal settlements, somewhere the animal associations with garbage and human associations with garbage in context of manual scavenging in 21st century needs 
specific consider consideration. A major part of this research, which dispelled the myth of relating numerous number of kites in Delhi with garbage was dispelled when we found out that people who follow Islamic faith toss meat in air to get rid of their sins. This meat chunks, these meat chunks which are tossed after the morning prayer form about 80% of kites diet into their breeding cycle. Kites logically take opportunity to nest near pockets or city pockets where we have mature and large trees which allow them easy access to these city systems. So while kites are doing this, they are interacting with different species which are also opportunistic into the system. Therefore, when we observe birds and different other animals in our backyards, we should always contextualize these observations in context of opportunities and challenges which these different animal species face. In a nutshell, this research allowed us to understand that the evolution of habitat preference or evolution of what kite prefers is dependent on multiple cues. These cues do not depict the nest productivity. Our research informed that the nest productivity was associated with the meat chunk or access to the meat chunks, which were tossed by people who were following Islamic faith and how safely could kites nest in a woodland or a parkland. So availability of these two resources also define how frequently a nesting space was being selected by a kite. I think this real life picture from a kite nest would allow you to understand the daily treasure hunt, which a kite is expected to undergo the male kite precisely because the female is under the lockdown for 60 days of the nesting cycle. The nesting cycle is roughly about 90 days and female needs to brood the eggs and chicks while the male delivers the treasure or meat chunks which are being philanthropically tossed. So the job of researchers is to understand how kites and of course there are different units of researchers, how kites and other opportunistic animals do this treasure hunt of obtaining foraging benefits from human systems while responding to the clues. So researchers call these clues as animal cues and I can discuss them in detail at the end of this presentation. Of course, there are population and level impacts of this opportunistic feeding, which our research could definitely identify. And about 90% of why kite density, about 90% of the component of kites density at a certain place were only explained by the availability of meat chunks which were being tossed by people in the study pockets and how frequently kites could identify a safe nesting tree so that these two resources can well be optimized. So in areas where you have enormous kite densities, these two resources, nesting substrate and meat chunks were available in huge profuse amounts. And this was of course in relation to how we understood individual kites priority around its nest. So kites focus in the area of about two kilometers centered upon its nest. And of course, individual preferences into these num numerous pockets where we have observed the kite densities for over the last seven, eight years allowed us to understand these relationships. An important aspect of these relationships wherein humans and their settlements, whenever it promotes animal association, is aggressive interaction. So you would sure would have heard of people who are either hit by a nesting bird. It can be kite in different parts of India for sure, because kites in other parts of the world do not attack people. And we tried to understand its phenomena from the point of view of the association between humans and the resources which we were giving to them. 
So our team is at times attacked by kites. And you can see on this picture that the, we get tattoos of this kind. And we wanted to understand it from a scientific perspective that why would a bird invest this much of cost. This cost comes from a constant hovering and alarming and attack. And our hypothesis were proven true in context of this dependence of defense scores of one, two, and three in terms of increasing severity on the basis of nest content on the stage of nesting, matural, nesting maturity and hab habitation of these birds into urbanized systems. So behavior of a bird or nesting densities, its population structure are being impacted by what humans are doing. Humans in this part of the world are not retaliatory to negative interactions of human to negative interactions with animals by and large. And this allows us to visualize what happens when thousands and millions of kites move down from the Central Asian steppes to the human dominated systems of South Asia. This is eBird data, which depicts the same time period of settlement of these birds into their native system in times of June and July from 1975 to 2019. And when you do the same analysis of eBird sightings, in between December and February every year, and data comes from 75 to 2019, you'd find that they are into their southern latitudes. It happens because this part of the world comes under the snow covers in the months of winter. And we got lucky to understand these movements from the landfills of Delhi in the year 2014, when we released one bird, which was wearing this tag. So this bird was caught in one part of Delhi and we fixed this transmitter using a backpack, which is pretty much like how you take the school bag or a map. Lines depict the to and fro movement of these birds from their native regions to the wintering regions in India. And it is important for us to appreciate the yellow pockets, which were 85 times larger than the wintering pocket depicted here in green. So you can imagine the kind of confluence, human impact of urban forage availability is causing on this enormous population of these birds. So we register thousands of these birds into the Delhi NCR system and they they are being funneled down from a very wide part of Mongolia, China, Kazakhstan, and about seven, eight different nations. It is also important to understand that they congregate onto cities which are lying on Silk Route. Here, there is a 5,000 year old town by the name Urumqi. And here, there is a river valley which has been associated with civilization for over 5,000 years, and it's called Hotan River Valley. These kites, for in the context of giving quick information, these kites depart from Delhi in February. Journey is slightly shorter. These birds start from October every year and they come down into the system till the month of October. It takes about four weeks for every bird which takes this journey from different parts of Central Asian steppes. And there is a clear demarcation of speed, which is again in relationship of these birds, or relationship of these birds with the wind patterns and with the weight of the bird and why a bird would actually be subjected to a certain selection pressure while moving from its native system to wintering system. We all are listening about the movement of people from their native regions to the areas where they, we all are listening about people who are moving from city systems to native regions during lockdown.
Dr. Nishant? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, we are uh, Almost. maybe some signal problem. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So, this last slide depicts the importance of what I was discussing in the first slide itself. Perhaps a lot of signal issues and there's something which allows you not to see the base of the slide. This slide comes from Zhu and Khalid's research paper, which depicts in different colors the bands of flyways which migrate. And part of the world, there are lesser number of triangles. It does not mean that we do not have those strains of flu in our system. It is because we have not yet. That why backyard? Why keeping waterfowl and chicken and different organisms in our backyard, which are frequently predated by birds like kites and other predators? And why the movement of kites from the native system to human dominated system? Or why movement of humans as such from the native system to the systems here needs a different domain of research, which has to cross disciplinary boundaries? At times, we understand mathematical models as something which can capture a lot of behavior and ecology. And our research papers also depict these set of relationships. But is mathematics the only way to abstract these relationships? Of course, researchers cannot identify all the interactions which are happening. And this slide somehow tries to depict a short picture of what might be happening in different ways under which people relate with animals around them. Of course, there are documented evidences that it leads to exchange of microbes, which can jump from animal systems to human. At times, understand why it is important for us to register the changes which are happening as our societies change at a fast rate when we have urban informal immigrant settlements happens not only by humans but also by different sets of animals and why such proximity and movement of people from urban settlement units to their rural settlement units needs to be registered. I would welcome questions for, for the this because we all do this research with the support I have from my team members. And I would thank the BCF team for arranging this virtual meeting. And of course, our funding agencies, which have always been so supportive. In case we have questions, I would definitely like to address them in case we have time. <laughs>